Okay, let's go ahead and, and kick off. Uh, uh, good evening from St. Louis. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to our event, whether it's your evening, your uh, night, uh, your morning, or your afternoon. Uh, my name is Kurt Dirks. I am the current director of the McDonald International Scholars Academy and the Vice Chancellor for International Affairs here at Washington University. And uh, I would I'm so pleased to be holding tonight's event uh, on behalf of the Academy. Uh, I'd like to do a, a few quick welcomes before we begin. Uh, first, we have alumni spread across the globe, and we're excited to have you with us. Uh, we have current scholars here at uh, the university who are excited to hear from our panel tonight. We have even scholars who have accepted the offer to join this fall, uh, joining us. A spe very special welcome to you to be able to hear from some of our alumni. By the way, for our audience, this was the most competitive year ever, so our current scholars are fantastic. I think we accepted only 5% of the total applicants this year. Uh, uh, we have a number of faculty ambassadors here, including uh, Jim Wirch, who you all know, uh, and so welcome Jim and the ambassadors. And then finally, we have, uh, have quite a few other friends and supporters of the Academy. So we have a very, very diverse audience here, and uh, we're excited to be able to hear from the panel tonight. Uh, just a real quick background before we, we turn this over to, uh, to Chancellor Wrighton. Uh, so this is our 15th year anniversary of the Academy. And uh, it's a, a very special year in that respect. Uh, although the pandemic uh, stopped us from doing some in-person events, obviously, we did not want to uh, let this stop us from being able to recognize and celebrate this 15th year. If you think back to the vision that the Academy was, uh, and is, it is to create a network of leaders who are experts in their field, who are spread across the globe, who, who can work together to, uh, to solve important problems, to educate uh, the future, uh, the future um, uh, leaders of the world, as well as to, uh, to do work in their respective fields. I think tonight's panel is a, is a great example of how that vision has become reality. We have four uh, alumni who are faculty at universities across the world and uh, doing tremendous work and they illustrate that network. And so uh, Chancellor Wrighton, your vision has coming true uh, and it, it's, it lives on. Um, we are, tonight is the first in a series of four alumni panel events. Uh, we'll have our uh, next one in June, which I'll announce at the end of tonight's session and tell you a little bit about that. Uh, so at this point, I want to turn it over to Chancellor Emeritus Mark Wrighton, who will take us through tonight's event. And I do not believe for any of you, Chancellor Wright needs an introduction. So I'm going to turn it right over to you, uh, to you, Mark. Uh, and thank you for doing this for us. Yes, well, this is um, a great evening here in St. Louis. We're having a, a touch of winter returning. Uh, even though we've had some really nice weather uh, this evening, it's going to be significantly below freezing. But by the weekend, we're going to have warmer weather and the skies are blue and the sun is shining. So things are really going well here in St. Louis. Like every institution and every person everywhere around the world, uh, we've been struggling with the pandemic. Uh, this particular event uh, is very special for a host of reasons, at least to me. And uh, it's very rare that I have the opportunity to speak in real time with people who are situated, uh, as I speak, in different parts of the world. Uh, of course, we have North America well represented, Europe, Asia, and uh, Latin America as well. So this is a really nice event. I'm hoping that we have uh, participation from the continent of Africa. I, I believe that there was at least one uh, registrant from Africa. But it really is great to see our alumni International Scholars Academy now pursuing academic careers. Uh, we envision that we would prepare uh, our students in the academy for global leadership, and you are beginning to illustrate what we had in mind. 
I'd like to acknowledge the tremendous work by Jim Wirch and his wife, Mary, in terms of building the academy for the first decade plus. And uh, he was right there at the very beginning, helping us to create what has become a very important program for Washington University. And now as our alumni are making their way in the world, uh, we're really proud of the impact uh, that the Academy is having. And we expect to hear some very interesting stories from our participants this evening. And I know those who are listening in who are McDonald scholars uh, may wish to ask questions and uh, you can do so by uh, typing your questions in the chat on the Zoom link and Angie will moderate uh, the Q&A after we have a moderated discussion uh, involving our four distinguished panelists. So for now, I would like our four panelists to introduce themselves uh, in alphabetical order, if you don't mind, because we see each other on the screen in a different way. So uh, we will hear first from someone who is either up very late or up very early from uh, Europe. So let's begin with Sherry. Thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, hi, I'm Sherry Ayuandini. I was the cohort uh, of 2010. Uh, I graduated from WashU uh, Anthropology PhD, a double degree with Univers University of Amsterdam in Sociology. Currently, I am a senior researcher in uh, University of Amsterdam. I'm leading a research project in five countries in Europe, supported by the Euro European Union. And in the fall, I'll be heading to Leiden University because I re just received a personal uh, research grant from the Dutch government amounting to a quarter of um, a, million, uh, a million euro. And I also established a research organization um, for policy making specifically that have uh, helped me to work with uh, different national governments and international institutions around the world. I have, uh, ever since I graduated, I've worked in, um, in Ghana, Uganda, Lebanon, Bangladesh, and uh, lastly, last year in Tajikistan as well, uh, doing qualitative research to inform policy making and um, program intervention. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, and congratulations on the uh, wonderful grant. That, that's <laughs> Thank a you. Good deal. Yeah, that's it wonderful. Is. Thank you. Thank you. I guess uh, next, uh, Professor Chen Li. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Uh, my name is Chen Li. I'm currently based at the Fudan University Law School. I, it's a partner institution. I moved back to China uh, three years ago. I joined Fudan. Now I've been running a do a degree program between Fudan and the Washington University Law School. I'm also on the faculty, a joint faculty of National University of Singapore. It's also a partner uh, institution of McDonald Academy. So glad to be on the panel today. Thank you for joining us. And next, uh, from Latin America, from Santiago, Fernando. Thank you, Mark. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I completed my PhD in finance in 2014. And since then I came back to Chile to join a, as a faculty member at University Alberto Hurtado. And um, in the last year, I have been doing research mostly focused on the Chilean pension system. And I have a number of research projects, some grants also, uh, that uh, I hope will shed some light in this uh, very important issue uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, some of the work I'm doing uh, will reach, uh, will provide insights to improve pension systems in Latin America and particularly promoting savings, which is very hard to do. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Great, thank you, and thank you for joining us. And um, our fourth panelist is uh, Professor Jing Zhu. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you all here. My name is Jing Xu. 
I uh, joined the academy in 2008 from Tsinghua University. Actually, this is a gift from a fellow Tsinghua Academy scholar, is our library in Tsinghua. Um, and I graduated uh, getting a, a PhD in anthropology uh, the year of 2014. Now I'm at the University of Washington. Right now I'm working um, with a fellowship from the National Academy of Education on projects related to Chinese morality education families through the lens of uh, studying child development. I think my long-term uh, theoretical uh, career ambition will be to uh, foster conversations between anthropology and social sciences and cognitive sciences. Um, and I recently started a project with psychologists across the globe who will look at truth, empowering human folk flourishing through um, epistemic vigilance as part of a, a kind of large scale research initiative called um, uh, called listening and learning in a polarized world. I think it's with very urgent significance to our current times. Thank you. Well, thank you all. And thank you uh, once again for joining this discussion this evening. I've visited uh, each of the partner institutions where you graduated. Uh, I have not visited all of the institutions where you are now working. Uh, I guess the exceptions are the University of Washington in Seattle and uh, Fudan University. But uh, I look forward to seeing you all in person, uh, either here on our campus and in due course, international travel will open up and I will look forward to seeing you in another setting. Let me begin the discussion uh, by asking all of you to answer the question. And I'll, I'll begin with uh, Fernando, but uh, what is it that uh, is a, you know, an attraction to pursue a career in academia? You, you graduated with a degree in finance, and uh, I dare say that you could be earning a lot more money with a PhD in finance uh, going into the business world uh, than being a professor. Uh, please tell us, uh, each of you, why uh, you have felt that an academic career would be so attractive. When, when I was in my- a minute, a minute and a half. Sure. When I was in my undergrad, finishing my undergrad, I had no idea what a PhD was. And when I asked the question, my answer was, no way, I won't study five more years. Uh, <laughs> then I worked in different institutions in the public and the private sector. And I noticed that the diagnosis uh, with which public policies were designed were uh, to some extent uh, too broad and incomplete. So I thought that in society, what I wanted to do is to provide research, data, analysis, that is independent, so we contribute to uh, society doing what I think, uh, what I like to do and what I do well. And, um, and the other reason for pursuing a PhD was independence. So because in, in Chile, Chile is a small country and the elite is, uh, is very concentrated. So there were few voices that would speak up about contentious issues without defending some type, type of interest. And actually, uh, I, I'm very happy now because I'm living up to that vision I had uh, when I started. And actually, I, I participate very actively in the debate uh, on pensions in Chile, which is one of the top issue, is the, is the most important issue uh, in the country. And it has been in the last eight years. Actually, since I, I left the academy and came here, I immediately joined uh, this debate. So, yeah. Great, that's very compelling uh, rationale. Uh, perhaps, uh, Sharia, you can tell us uh, what has stimulated you to pursue an academic career. Yes, um, I've always been my it's always been my passion to actually bridge um, academia and also uh, more practical work because uh, before I went for my PhD, I work a lot in development sector. 
So, uh, like I said, uh, I establish right now a research organization to inform policy making. So my involvement in academia is still is also very much informed with my activities in in the practical world as well. And I found that in academia, um, there's always um, a standard of excellence where in the practical world, it is a little bit harder to aim for. So there's a little bit more uh, reflection in terms of what do you do? What are the different innovations that you can aim for? While you're working in a practical world, usually you just do, 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 and, and just practicing and making sure that things happen. But in academia, you do have a chance to be reflective, to be even uh, self-critical in terms of your approach in doing things. Um, and that's why balancing both to me makes perfect sense. Um, in, uh, in 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 what I'm what I'm doing, and um, so that's uh, the main reason why um, I'm attracted to the academic career. And also, um, if you have an academic career, uh, people uh, would trust you in terms of your excellence and professionalism. So that's also a, a plus in a sense. Great, that's very compelling too, um, Professor Zhu. What brings you into academia? I think I've always been interested in kind of uh, intellectual, purely intellectual questions. I think no other place in the world has that um, luxurious freedom to allow me to pursue the kind of questions I'm interested in. For example, studying human nature by looking at infants, toddlers, young children, or to understand Chinese culture in its fullest sense. What does it really mean? What is China? What is Chinese culture? Why does this society has, can sustain itself over millenniums of time with longest written history? And all these kind of a, um, broad and sometimes risky questions that cannot be pursued in other realms of uh, social domains. So that's why I come to academia and also choose a very kind of unconventional interdisciplinary route of uh, inquiry. That's wonderful. Um, intellectual strength is your aspiration. Uh, Shen Li, uh, you, like Fernando, uh, have um, you know, a professional background in the law, in this case, and uh, you too could be working in a law firm with uh, very lucrative uh, positions. You've also uh, been uh, in a significant number of institutions. Uh, why have you pursued academia and why is it that you have chosen Fudan University? Uh, thank you very much, Chancellor, for the question. I was very interested in promoting rule of law at my home country. And I thought the best way to do that, however, is not for me to work as a lawyer. Uh, I think the best way for me to promote my vision uh, to, to essentially to help improve law of law in China is to join a university. Uh, Fudan is located in Shanghai, it's one of top university. I think this university would provide me with a platform for me eventually to influence a generation of young people in China. I think the best way to promote law of law in China probably is you try to get the opportunity to connect with young people. Then you try to share with them uh, your thoughts, your ideas in a very, small way, you might be able to leave an impact on them. And over time, I think we are going to see a great deal of progress in China in terms of rule of law. For this reason, I decided uh, since day one that I want to become a professor and I want to move back to China after finishing my study. Well, like Fernando, um, when I entered college, I had no idea what it would be to earn a PhD. And uh, for me, it was quite accidental. I, I earned a PhD in chemistry. And uh, when I was working on that degree, I was thinking I'm gonna go to work at the DuPont company and I'm going to be a researcher and I'm going to be uh, very well employed and make money. And uh, one day my PhD advisor came into my laboratory and said, there's a job open uh, at Harvard, you ought to apply for it. And I never applied for an industry position. I never regretted it, 
but I was far less forethoughtful than all of you. And I thank you for joining academia. Uh, you are making all of us at Washington University proud. And uh, I'd like to ask a question uh, that perhaps our current scholars and future scholars will have uh, you know, an interest in, in, in your answer. What is it that you would advise? Uh, what would you say to a person who is indicating an interest in becoming a part of academia after they graduate their degree from Washington University? Uh, maybe we'll begin with that uh, bit of ad advising from uh, Chen Li. Uh, my advice is you really need to have a passion for the life in academia. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, uh, to enjoy life in academia. Uh, so first and foremost, I think you should really ask yourself a, a very important question. Are you really interested? Do you really uh, have a passion for academia? Second, you should ask yourself, this very simple question. Are you a curious person? Are you interested in finding answers to a lot of, of uh, things? And third, I think uh, it's quite important that you should develop a skill uh, in, in doing research and writing because at the end of the day, uh, nowadays in academia, uh, either you publish or perish. In order for you to do well in academia, I think you probably need a passion and you need curiosity and Good writing skill. Great, um, Sharia. What would it would you uh, give as advice to an aspiring academician? Um, my advice would be probably slightly different, um, similar to what Chen Li just said. Um, hang on to your passion, uh, but your passion doesn't necessarily to be exactly the same with everyone else's passion in academia. Because even though you're part of academia, there are things that you like more compared to other people who are working the same way. Because to be honest, in academia, sometimes it could be um, quite monotonous or repetitive. Like Chen Li said, you might be expected to write a paper, apply for a grant, teaching in a classroom. But hanging on to your passion and not forgetting to also uh, kind of nurture that passion really allows you to then be to excel in a particular thing. In my case, for example, my passion is that bridging that academia with more practical world. That's why I also do a lot more research that is informing policymaking rather than uh, just to write an article out of it, for example. And I, uh, I, I focus on that and make sure that I make time for that passion to still continue despite of the other uh, maybe demands made of me uh, from the academia world. So that really helps not only kind of help your motivations and, and keep you going, but also kind of give you that uniqueness and, and, and makes you different and give you a, a particular excellence compared to maybe your, your colleague and other people in academia. So my advice is to maybe if you don't know yet to figure out what is that passion of yours and figure out how can you um, nurture that passion in academia. And uh, the se a second one, a shorter one is, um, Network building is significant. I was actually really afraid of that when I first started because I was quite a shy person at the beginning. Uh, but basically, if you make any connections, um, hang on to that. If someone introduced you to someone, never said no. Always uh, meet that person, always build that connections. Uh, my uh, PhD supervisor and my ambassador is here, uh, John Bowen. He knows a lot about how uh, talking to people and people that he introduced me to really opens doors to future projects, future possibilities. So um, really build that connections. And I think we can start with just our, you know, fellow uh, Mac McDonald Academy uh, scholars as well. So that has been really helpful for me. Well, thank you. Uh, both of you uh, who have spoken uh, indicate that uh, developing an understanding of what is your passion will be important as you pursue an academic career. To all the scholars who are not, uh, you know, aspiring to be academicians, I, I think the same advice will apply. Uh, you need to develop passion, do what you love, and uh, work to prepare yourself for that uh, area of activity. But uh, Jing, do you have uh, suggestions 
for aspiring academicians. Thank you, Chancellor Ryden. I really echo um, both Chen Li, Li Chen, and Sharia's advice that if you really love what you're doing in terms of research and, and the kind of things academia can afford you, go for it. Otherwise, it's a very challenging route, especially in the current climate. And I want to say that uh, on top of passion and um, curiosity and all that, I really want to emphasize some other attributes. Uh, first is be critical because academic kind of journey is all about being conscious of your own limitations and also other works limitations. You have to keep criticizing and pushing the things forward, but also be very collegial, be open-minded, be, be ready to collaborate and help each other in this very challenging route. Another thing I want to emphasize is um, being able to endure loneliness because it's a very lonely journey, even though maybe, I mean, it differs the kind of uh, work mode. Humanity scholars will, we produce um, so authored monograph, for example, and some other people in other fields, you work in collaborative lab, but, but regardless, I think it's a very lonely journey. You have to constantly think about all these, think about the questions that you don't have answers for, think about the challenges, it's, it's not, that easy. At the same time, um, be ready to accept failures because you will have rejections from grants, from jobs, from from um, <laughs> article submissions. And it's, I mean, for junior scholars, uh, I think I've learned to slightly overcome that kind of self-doubt. I think it's a long journey and you will always find that um, challenging. You get a rejection, you get criticism, you get you doubt of whether what you're doing really makes sense or has any value, but I think that is normal. It's, it's, it's nice to know that you are not alone. I remember once um, Jim was my mentor. He, I think right after graduation, he asked me, do you find writing challenging? Uh, right after I finished my dissertation of writing a defense, I was like, oh, should I say it's not challenging? I, mean, I finished my dissertation, but he said he found that still challenging himself. I think it's very, very, um, encouraging and validating for a senior scholar, your mentor to say that actually writing will always be challenging. So I think be pre prepared for that and have a open mind to that. So that's my advice. Thank you. Well, the encouragement to be resilient and to be able to deal with what I think is a, a degree of loneliness in academia, that loneliness stems from, uh, you know, the way that your colleagues will evaluate your work. Uh, if you're in a position where you're aspiring to be promoted, uh, it's your individual achievement that will matter. And even though it could be a contribution, to a collaborative endeavor, uh, people will try to tease that apart and figure out what was your individual contribution. And sometimes that gets in the way of open and fruitful collaboration. But I think uh, as we look ahead, uh, every field of endeavor is becoming more complex and requiring more intellectual breadth. Uh, and this opens the opportunity for very meaningful collaboration. And I hope uh, the experiences that you've had at the McDonald Academy uh, prepare you better than most people for you know, engaging with people from other disciplines. Fernando, what's your advice? I, I have a word of warning for PhD students. Uh, the word of warning is, uh, is the following. We need to be very careful with the uh, reference that we consider. The faculty at Washington University are a group of people that are highly accomplished, that are very successful. And that group is in the top of the distribution of talent and productivity that you have the combination of talent and luck. So, in, and in the world we live today, it's very easy to get confused trying to set in a goal that is not aligned 
with your with what you have in your heart. Your goal can be uh, writing a a, num, a a very long, have a very long list of papers in your CV, making money, getting this grant, etc. You can operationalize your goal in a way that is not coherent with what you have in your heart. And it's very difficult to realize that when you are immersed in a place where you don't see the entire distribution of people like you. And so my, my advice would be, be careful to listen to your heart and find your vocation. Because if you do that, which is in line with what, with what the other says, uh, if you do that, you will do well, you will have fun, and you will, you will make the most, the, the highest contribution to society. Uh, I think of society as a body. And if we are a right hand, we will have a very difficult time trying to be a toe or a nose. So the sooner we find what we are, what we love, what we enjoy, uh, the easier will be uh, all the way uh, all the way ahead. And you see in this in this group of panelists, you see we all did the PhD, which in uh, trains you to do research and to follow an academic career. But if you if you look at our profiles, we have very different uh, trajectories in our in our in our career. And but as what I can see here is that everybody is very happy with what they are doing, and I think that's what we. Uh, everybody should look for because if you are happy you will do you will you will be the best uh, facet of yourself yes I agree with you that um, and I'm impressed with the people who study happiness and um, you need a certain level of financial well-being but uh, it's been shown that if you're a billionaire in US terms, uh, you're no happier than a person who's, you know, let's say at the level of $100,000 in terms of compensation. So uh, I think all of your answers were really great. Uh, we're moving along in time. I'm gonna ask uh, two other questions of the panelists, and uh, then I'm going to open the uh, program to input and questions from uh, those who are participating uh, in our Zoom uh, webinar. So the first question, and I'd like you to answer this very briefly. Uh, tell me uh, in your own setting in this past year, uh, how have you uh, had to cope with the pandemic? Chen Li. So for me, essentially it's trying to adapt to uh, remote teaching but fortunately, uh, we got very good equipment. And uh, second, I think uh, the challenge I face is how to deal with students who live in remote area of China because the internet connection was not very good. Then I realized there was still a great deal of inequality in China as though we are at a very prestigious, very well-funded university. But we look at the student situation, uh, it was challenging. Great. Well, we have the digital divide, certainly in the United States. And in the front page of the New York Times this morning, uh, President Biden has uh, developed an infrastructure plan and is uh, wanting to devote $100 billion to uh, high-speed internet access. Jing Yu. How have you coped with the pandemic? I think I'm in a very privileged position uh, in the pandemic. I don't have teaching obligation, I was doing research, but I'm also uh, homeschooling, semi-homeschooling a child. Um, I think <laughs> it really, um, the pandemic really forced me to be creative. I was fortunate enough to work with existing data because otherwise in my field as anthropologists, we, go, we have to travel to collect field data in all, all kinds of parts of the world. So it forced me to really uh, not only uh, kind of uh, stay with what we have, 
but also to learn new methods. For example, I never even thought about learning programming <laughs> uh, at all, but these textual data forced me to learn new techniques from data science and to collaborate with new set of uh, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's hear from uh, Fernando in Chile. Well, my institution is a Jesuit institution that targets uh, intentionally uh, a group of low income students. So we have these uh, difficulties to connect. Uh, our students were hit by unemployment, contagion, and, and all sorts of things. Uh, we went online since the, uh, since the pandemic started and the university provided scholarships to uh, to, to support uh, students and also tablets and, 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 and things like that. Uh, we try to be as flexible as possible, uh, providing support to the students and being flexible also in terms of evaluations and classes. Uh, I personally, uh, what I did was to not focus on uh, avoid, avoid uh, uh, say that students share answers to tests. So what I did was uh, activities where they had to provide uh, financial advice to people in their community. So they would write a case and you know, do the numbers and, and then show that as their work. And they were very happy because they saw that uh, an immediate application of what they were learning. So. Uh, so that's what the university did. And in my case, the, the, I had a very good experience with my students. Very good. Um, been a challenge for all of us. Uh, the Chancellor of Washington University, Andrew Martin, has recently communicated to the community here that we will be substantially in person as we begin the fall semester. Large lecture classes will probably still be by Zoom, uh, but uh, we expect uh, a lot of learning to take place in person in the classroom. My final question for the panelists uh, needs to be answered very briskly, but it's a very important question. I referenced uh, the importance of interdisciplinary work and that the Academy provides the opportunity for our scholars to interact with people from many different fields. What is it that you feel has had the greatest impact on your career so far? Uh, what is it about the McDonald Academy that's been fruitful? Sharia. Well, definitely uh, being connected to um, really excellent students and excellent experts from different countries and different backgrounds has really prepared me from the kind of work that I'm doing at the moment because of the research. Uh, for example, this uh, research project that I'm leading across six countries, five in Europe and one in South Africa, involve people of a uh, different background, not just a social scientist like I am, but also nutritionists, psychologists, uh, public health um, practitioners. And each of us has a very different way of looking at things. So there are quite some um, adjustment in terms of how do we see and work on things together, implement things together. But this way of bridging um, differences, uh, I really learned a lot from my time with the academy. And something that is a little bit more tangible than that, I already started reaching out to uh, McDonald Academy alumni to start building um, some to find collaborative work. So for example, uh, with Michael in, uh, who's right now in Vietnam, uh, when my organization had work in Vietnam, we, uh, I actually reached out to Michael and, um, and find out a way to actually collaborate and um, with, with his organization in Vietnam in order to do research project there. And I hope to be able to do that as well with everyone um, um, in, in, in your country. So, um, and please do reach out back as well, because this is the kind of really tangible and possible collaborations that we can have uh, between us as McDonald Academy scholars and McDonald Academy alumni. So um, I actually rely on McDonald Academy uh, members uh, in doing my work as well. Thank you very much. I I really appreciate what 
you're saying, and uh, I think you touched on some very important points, especially the notion of being able to interact with alumni. Uh, I think it was Jim Lurch who first said, you're McDonald Scholars for life. And uh, we hope that uh, there will be productive relationships that begin with your time as a scholar, and then that these are elaborated as your career unfolds. Uh, Jing Yu, Zhu. Thank you for this what question. What was the big impact? I think it's, it's the consciousness, consciousness of being global. Um, part of it is because I'm an anthropologist, but also uh, Jim and all the other uh, people in the academy keep encouraging us to think about cross-cultural, cross-societal communication. I think, more, I think more and more, especially after I graduated from the McDonald Academy, especially given the current geopolitical climate, and I do believe you know, there is more than two governments, more than democracy versus an entity. So there's, there's really actual people, actual lives, and uh, actual stories to be told. And I keep that um, closely in my heart as both uh, as a scholar and as a person communicating in professional um, uh, realms and also in other ways. Thank you. Fernando, what was uh, the greatest impact for you? I think the sum of the different interactions that I had with so many interesting people over five years. Uh, I think it is the sum of these interactions uh, from an informal conversation to the exposure to a global issue that provided me, I could speak of it in terms of a stock of social capital that is very, very valuable. And today, as Sheria points out, we are members of uh, a community that is growing and growing. And whenever we have an opportunity, uh, we know that we shared an experience that was very intimate and we can reach out and uh, take advantage of uh, the opportunities that arise uh, and that's for life. So, talk of social capital is something that is growing as the academy grows and uh, uh, it can activate uh, very interesting opportunities uh, as, as they arise. Great. And uh, Chen Li. I think uh, there are two forum at WashU, particularly at academy, greatly augmented my exposure to interdisciplinary research and knowledge. The first is uh, the events symposium at Academy that brought together a lot of people and again the opportunity to interact with people from a very different discipline and I joined conversation with them through other events uh, that I think again great your exposure. Second it's the uh, Academy accommodation. Uh, I, I mean when I was a scholar I live on accommodation, I got opportunity to interact with scholars from different country, a more informal setting. And we had a great deal of conversation on environmental engineering, earth science, and all these topics. Uh, eventually this greatly uh, expanded my interdisciplinary knowledge or at least helped me to do research through interdisciplinary method. Thank you. Well, thank you all, and uh, I'm delighted that you uh, accepted our offer to be McDonald Scholars. Uh, we're very proud of you. I'm now going to open the Q&A to those who are participating online. And uh, if you have a question, uh, please uh, type it in the chat. Uh, we have two questions already. One is uh, from an alumna, Jane Lee. I believe she was a student at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology before coming to Washington University as a McDonald Scholar in the Brown School. And her question is, how do you see teaching and interaction with students as part of your job? And I know that a couple of you have been quite active in uh, the teaching role but a couple have been more focused on other academic activities. So Fernando and uh, Chen Li, I know you've been uh, very active in your uh, teaching. How 
have you interact with students? Chen Li. So for me, I greatly enjoy teaching. And I think if you really want to make a small impact, uh, teaching probably the best way to help students to get the idea and to engage in two-way communication. So I think it's incredibly important uh, for us. If, if you are interested in academia, uh, you really probably need to sharpen your skill in teaching. Essentially, it's how to communicate with people, how to simplify things. Uh, this probably is most important. Thank you. Fernando. Well, teaching for me is, is very exciting because uh, through teaching, uh, in this group of students that are come from economically disadvantaged backgrounds, you can change, you can change lives. And here, uh, there is something that I, that, uh, I learned from the academy, from the leadership of the academy, uh, Jim, Mary, uh, Angie, Christine, the ladies, etc., John, Mark. Uh, I, I have tried to copy what, uh, what you did. Chile has a, some sort of a hierarchical culture. So uh, it's, for me, was very, was very rare to uh, have, say, a so close interaction the first time, you know, I, uh, the first time I, I, I went to, to, to the activities of the McDonald. And um, the fact that you care for the students you take time to know us. You took time to see that we are doing okay. To see, you know, how can we progress? You have many, you know, you have a very limited time, and uh, very uh, uh, you could be doing a number of very productive things that will go to your curriculum, to your pocket, or to your egos. Uh, but you took the time, and and you spent time with us, and so. Uh, I have tried to replicate that, and I have a number of students by now that I have mentored, and they have uh, they have done great jobs. I have showed them uh, some uh, alternatives of career that they can pursue. I have provided them the skills, especially the soft skills that they needed uh, to pursue those careers. And I see them flourishing and very successful, and that's so gratifying that you know it's uh, it's I'm very that's a very very uh, gracious part of my work. I really love it. Great. Jing, I know you've been interacting with students. Uh, how about you? Um, I think I I think teaching is uh, also a learning process. We learn from each other, so kind of with a very empathic heart in, in, in interacting with students, thinking that when I was at their age, I was not as good as they are. And I think it's kind of mutual interaction um, and confirmation that really makes an even small impact on individual persons. So that is my view. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Sharia, do you have any comments about the role of teaching uh, and students in your work? Yes, I have been uh, um, privileged to, uh, to be able to teach in different places. So I thought when I was in the US, now in Europe, and I also, because I was originally from Indonesia, I also taught in Indonesia. And what I learned is that students are different from uh, one place to the next. And it's really important to understand what exactly they're looking for uh, when they enter the classroom and your interaction with them uh, would be would benefit from uh, from accommodating that. And the other part is that to really have an eye on diversity to make sure that when uh, your interaction with them also accommodate different kind of diversity of your students as well as different kind of diversities of opinions, uh, including uh, your own. So, uh, like Jing said, it's also an opportunity for you to learn. It also means to, an opportunity for you to acknowledge your own limitations and um, to actually grow from your interactions with your with your students. Uh, so that's so far what um, what I learned. That it's it's important to to learn from your students as well and to understand that you have uh, limitations and to accommodate different diversities in different classrooms around the world. Great. Um, I would. 
give just a little bit of advice here to those who are aspiring to academic positions. If you're not interested in students, probably academia is not for you. If you're only interested in research, there are really great research institutes, national laboratories, even companies where you can do great work and uh, not having the opportunity to interact with students. Let's move on to another question. This one coming in from uh, Ona uh, from Africa and says, I'm curious to know some of the most defining events and aspects of your time at Washington University and the McDonald Academy. And uh, have there been any surprises along the way during your post-Washington University path? Let's answer this very, very quickly. Uh, Jing, any surprises? Any defining event? Uh, defining event, I think one thing is PhD in 3D, it really forces you to, to pitch your research, your story to a much broader audience. That is a very, very, very challenging moment, I think, in the whole academy education. And another, on the personal level, my son, when he was less than two months old, he got on a plane for the first time in his life with us to New York City as part of the academy trip. I learned that you, I can accomplish so much with the help from, from the big family. So that is that is very good memory. Thank you. Fernando, any uh, standout events Sur uh, at Washington University? Uh, a surprise. Uh, I started the PhD with the idea that I will discover something very clever that will improve the allocation of resources and people will end up with more money in their pockets. And by the second year, I had a very different uh, view of what impact is. And I realized that impact could be through teaching, impact could be through advising, impact can take so many ways. So since then, uh, I mean, and that, and that event, uh, help me to uh, see society as a body and try to find what is my place in this body so I can do the, I can do the best you know, for society. And I'm still doing the fine tuning. <laughs> <laughs> it requires continuous application of your creativity. Uh, um, I'm going to ask uh, Chun Li uh, a, a particular question that's come up from uh, Professor Shen Yang Guo, who is our ambassador to Fudan University uh, and a distinguished graduate of Fudan and now a really important professor in the Brown School. He asks, uh, due to geopolitical reasons, currently there are tensions between U.S. and China. What can we do to continue our work to accomplish the Academy's mission, focusing on globalization? Great, this is a fantastic question. So thank you, uh, Professor Guo. I, I think it, it's quite important uh, for our Academy, it's quite important that we should be a forum, a place to bring people together, particularly American scholar and Chinese scholar. It's much better for us to have a conversation, uh, honest, candid and strict, forward conversation with each other. I think the academy could serve as a great place uh, to, to bring people together. I hope the academy, uh, particularly, now I'm based at the Fudan, I'll be very happy to invite and sponsor uh, American professors to come to Fudan to, to, to visit uh, as well as to have uh, conversations. Uh, we could touch upon some very controversial topics uh, as long as we came to the conversation with open mind, I'm pretty sure uh, we could contribute uh, to 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 Sino-U.S. relationship, try to improve the relationship uh, in a very small way. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, very uh, uh, enthusiastic about continuing the mission of the McDonald International Scholars Academy. 
I believe that working collaboratively across international lines is going to be extremely important. I'm very positive about the early days of the Biden administration embracing the commitment to address climate change, for example. Uh, not everything is perfect. Uh, as we know, there are challenges on our southern border, and President Biden is already receiving criticism in connection with those challenges. But I'm confident that by working collaboratively, we can do uh, better, and that there is a higher probability that we're going to be able to solve these international challenges. I wanna thank all of our participants for uh, coming to this important event. I'm grateful to our four panelists. Uh, you are doing great work. We look forward to hearing more about what you do and uh, we'll look forward to following your careers. I'll turn it over to Kurt Dirks uh, for closing comments and an announcement about the next program in this four part series. Kurt Dirks. Well, great. I want to uh, to join Mark in thanking our, our panelists tonight. I think uh, all kinds of excellent wisdom and advice and insight from you. Um, and you are also certainly great examples for our current scholars and our, and our incoming scholars. Um, uh, as I think Jim said in the comments, we're also very proud of you. We're, and in fact, also proud of all our scholars. You are uh, representatives of a much broader community as you know. And so um, thank you uh, for joining us tonight. My second thank you is to uh, Angie who uh, helped to envision tonight and pull, put it all together and pull it off. Um, Angie did a tremendous job in, in bringing this together and we are really excited to be able to do uh, our next event. And then finally, uh, a special thanks to Mark. Uh, again, this was uh, uh, possible um, uh, because of that vision you had 15 years ago, uh, working with John and, and helping uh, along with Jim to bring this together. And so thanks for tonight, um, but even more thanks for helping to, uh, to, to make this come true with your vision and your work, your many efforts over the years. I've got a couple more, um, just real quick things. And then I think Angie said, we're bringing everyone on to get a great screenshot uh, of, of, uh, of us. Um, and so I'm gonna do just two, uh, a couple more things before we, before we uh, do that. Um, first, I want to join uh, what uh, Shreya had mentioned, which is uh, this notion of reaching out. So one of the calls for action tonight uh, to each of the people on this is to reach out uh, to someone else. It could be one of our four panelists, could be one of the other alumni, and, or it could be one of our current scholars. And uh, it is this notion of community, which is at the heart of the Academy, as you heard tonight. And, uh, and so the, to really make this come to life is to use tonight. We didn't have time to bring together to have uh, uh, breakout sessions or chats. And so, but I will encourage all of you to, to, to reach out to at least one person um, tonight, uh, after tonight to, uh, to make that Academy uh, come true. Um, uh, one more, more somber thing uh, to think about, but very important. And, uh, you know, the, as Mark mentioned, the Academy and its vision is really uh, more important than ever. Um, as we heard from uh, Professor Go and others, there, the, you know, this uh, year has had so many challenges, whether it's political or other. You know, one of the current challenges we're seeing a lot in the news, um, it's, it's, it's been there long before this, but in the news is xenophobia. Um, and uh, we all share a common belief that you know, each individual deserves and must be treated with that dignity and respect, no matter their origin, their race, their identity. And uh, to really make this come to life, I think each of us can do uh, something to help with that. One of the greatest strengths of the Academy uh, community is its magnificent diversity, and, uh, and we can really help to lead the way on, uh, on addressing this important problem. All right, the last announcement. Is, uh, is our next event, uh, June 10th. Put this on your calendar, June 10th. I think we're currently looking around four o'clock uh, in St. Louis time to do this. It's gonna be focused on uh, our alumni from the corporate and professional setting. And so this will be our next uh, uh, alumni event that we're gonna be doing. By the way, we will have PhD in 3D coming up before that. As, uh, as, as we heard about. Uh, but uh, our next alumni event is June 10th, Corporate and Professionals. And it's very uh, special. Uh, we're very excited to have John McDonald uh, be our uh, moderator for that uh, event. 
Um, if you have feedback about uh, tonight or other things that you want to mm -hmm. give us to prep for that, uh, please uh, please share that with Angie, and we will we will make sure to put that together. All right, uh, Angie, do we are we ready to go as we uh, as we wrap up tonight? <laughs> yes, I. I am readily am trying to promote as many people to panelists as possible. <laughs> We've lost a few people along the way. We had a, a much bigger audience, but uh, say hi to everyone. <laughs> David Connor. Huh? Yeah. Have a few more. Hang on. Let us in. Oh, on your cameras. Hey, there's a door. Oh, look at. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Door is actually just sitting across me. <laughs> oh, that's a good place for him to be. <laughs> yeah, there. <laughs> He's flipping his computer. Oh, there he is. Oh, my. Hi, everybody. Hey, hey, hello, everybody. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hi. Terrific. <laughs> I'm going to take a couple oh, wow. of shots. Wow. So that we can put this on our website. Together. This is awesome. There we are. Yeah. There's David. Yeah. Hey. Realized my camera was off. Hi, everybody. Hi. Oh, hi, David. Hi. <laughs> so great to see you guys. This is great. Great to see you. Good to see you. You're all the same. David. <laughs> hey, Chelly. <laughs> yes. Nice to see you on screen. Thank you. Latoya. Yeah. Hi, Latoya. Hi, Pierre. Hi. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. This has been absolutely wonderful, and we look forward to doing this again in June. I hope everybody will join us again, and we'll have even more people to, to show on our little last screen here. Thanks for hanging out with us this evening, guys. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank wonderful. you. Thanks thank for you. organizing, Angie. Thank you for organizing that. Bye, Thanks, Angie. Bye. 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 Great to see Bye. you all. Thank Bye. you for participating. Bye, Councillor. <laughs>